The year was 1976. A six-year-old kid named Omi Thao and her siblings were awakened by her mother. The mother said, they are here and we need to go now. So communists had invaded Laos the year before and Christians were no longer safe in town. And the soldiers were getting near to Omi's village. So Omi's family and others snuck away to the outskirts of the city where guides waited to escort them to Thailand. They went through nights of heavy rain and muddy trails and in daylight, it was said that they would hide under bushes from soldiers and their feet were bruised and bleeding. So as you can tell, it was not an easy journey. And even to their horror, they found the bones of earlier refugees who died trying to flee from Laos. After about 12 days, Omi and her family reached the Thailand border. And when they got there, an official tried to extort money from Omi's mother and clubbed her to the ground because she had none. The entire family was put into a refugee camp and into a jail cell where they had very little food. In fact, several refugees starved to death in there. Despite such horrible events, Omi said, and I quote, We rejoiced daily and as followers of Jesus, thanked God for his protection over our lives. Despite the hardship, we knew we had to keep persevering and enduring for we had the hope that others did not have. So after enduring this camp for about two years, Omi's family got a letter from a relative in the U.S. offering to sponsor them for immigration. So in 1979, they were flown to Wisconsin. Life in America was hard at first and it had a lot of challenges, just like with any other immigrants. But Omi worked through it and she earned a master's degree and went on to serve in church ministry with her husband. She wrote, all the hardships I faced in Laos and in Thailand, God faithfully turned into blessings. I'm telling you, this is not an isolated story in the world. This is a very common story you'll hear in many countries, not just in the past few decades, but pretty much in the last couple of millenniums since the church started. We have seen persecution come from the government, from schools, from friends, and sadly, even from family members. And when this happens, I think it's very easy for us to just lose hope and to give up our faith and to get angry with God. But the church, despite all the persecution it has gone through, it has persevered and stayed obedient to Christ. Do you know why? Because of the hope of eternal life that is in the gospel. That is the thing that gets us through any situation, no matter how hard it gets. When we place our eyes on the prize, on the goal of where we're going to, we will persevere through any situation. And that's actually what we see with the Smyrna church in the book of Revelation that we're going to be looking at today in chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. So that's where you need to be. So just to give you a little background, once again, the book of Revelation is a book that summarizes the end times, which culminates in the return of Christ in Judgment Day and in the setting up of the new heavens and the new earth. So what Jesus first does is he addresses seven specific churches to describe to them their specific situations about what he likes and what he doesn't like. And this is pretty much problems that you're going to see throughout church history until Jesus returns for his church and he starts his end times program with the world. So after describing the pros and cons of the Ephesian church, which we saw last week, today in this passage, Jesus is now going to address the church in Smyrna, the second of the seven churches. And you know, interestingly, this is only one of two churches where Jesus has no rebuke, no criticism of any kind. 
In fact, he commends them for being so faithful to Jesus, even though they were persecuted so heavily, and he tells them to press on, to continue. And that's the main point of today's passage. So today, Jesus gives us his two analytical views of the Smyrna church to exhort us to be a faithful church in the face of persecution. That's pretty much the main idea of today's passage. So let's look at Jesus' first view. So in his first view, Jesus expresses his analysis of the church. So in verses 8 to 9, he's going to give his analysis of the Smyrna church. So let's look at the first couple verses in today's passage. In verse 8, he begins and says, To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, Okay, let's stop there for a second. Just to give you a little background on Smyrna, just so you can envision it a little bit. It was an ancient city which was first settled by the Greeks in about 1000 BC. About 600 BC, the city was destroyed and lay in ruins for more than 300 years until two of Alexander the Great's successor rebuilt the city in 290 BC, which was the city of John's day, the Apostle John. And it was said to be a very beautiful city. It was the center of science and medicine. And today, it is the Turkish city known as Izmir. Have you guys heard of this before? Okay, you can look it up. It's actually a pretty popular tourist site in Turkey. So now Jesus is going to address this church. He says, The first and the last, who is dead and has come to life, says this. Yep, Jesus once again hits home. Who he is, he says, I am the first and the last, meaning that he is eternal. That's the title for God. And he says that he was once dead, but now he has resurrected. That's pretty much the story of the gospel, right? Remember in his first coming, he came in order to live a sinless life, a perfect life as a substitute for us. And then he was killed on the cross. He was nailed on the cross as a substitute for our sins so that we can be forgiven of our sins. And he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead to show everybody that he was the son of God. And when we repent and place our faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, we will also be forgiven and have eternal life. That is the gospel news. And that's the reason why the Smyrna church can persevere in hope because of this. And Jesus wants to remind them this once again. So now this is what he says in verse 9. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are synagogue of Satan. Yes, this church experienced a lot of tribulation. You know what that word tribulation means? It means pressure. It means troubles. So what kind of troubles were going on here? Well, apparently a lot of this trouble was coming coming from Jewish people. Jewish people who hated Christians. And I don't think we're surprised to hear this, right? That these Jewish people were the ones who were harassing, making fun, oppressing the Christian, and even trying to rat them out, saying to the Roman government that these Christians, oh, they refuse to worship Caesar. They refuse to offer up sacrifices to Caesar. They wanted to do whatever they can to get them in trouble. Then what does Jesus think about this? He says, these Jewish people, even though they appear like worshipers of God, oh yeah, they have their services, they read from the book, but he says that they are a synagogue of Satan. Wow, those are harsh words. He's saying that this church is completely apostate, meaning that they have no saving relationship with God whatsoever. And of course, we know that because you can only have a saving relationship with God if you have believed in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And apparently, this group has not. They are misrepresenting the character of God. Yes, physically, they are Jews, but inwardly, they are not according to God. And you know, this can even be said of churches as well. Oh yeah, there are many churches out there that are pretty much churches of Satan because they have abandoned the gospel and they have gone completely into worldliness. 
But Jesus tells them, don't be discouraged. Hang in there. Remember I read earlier in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. I don't know if you guys see tribulation, any persecution happening in churches locally around this area, but this is quite a phenomenon around the world. According to Open Doors Ministry, they reported that about 260 million Christians around the world suffer high persecution for following Jesus. One in nine Christians worldwide suffer from high levels of persecution. They continue and say each day, 11 Christians are killed for their faith in the top 50 most anti-Christian countries. And about 9,488 churches and other Christian-related buildings were attacked and sometimes destroyed. About 3,711 Christians were arrested and detained without trials. And 11 countries are ranked for their extreme level of Christian persecution. So as we speak right now, I need you to even lift up a prayer for all of these Christians around the world because they are desperately seeking help. And this is true even back then when Jesus was addressing the Smyrna church. Really, this church was, from the outside, it looks like they were in a miserable situation because a lot of these people in the church apparently were poor. It says it right here. And even those who did have resource, they probably sacrificed a lot of it for the sake of the gospel. But Jesus tells them, you're poor, maybe economically, maybe you don't have many resources, but in fact, you are rich. So what is Jesus telling them? He's basically saying to them, because of your faithfulness and your service, you have rewards in heaven. Not just eternal life, but the rewards that are coming. And that's really one of the main reasons why we should work for the Lord and not focus on the riches of this world. You see, Jesus contrasts the people in this church to the Laodicean church, which, which we are going to look at in a few weeks in chapter 3, because in that church, people were outwardly rich, but Jesus told them that they were spiritually poor. <gasps> no, yeah, that's really where you don't want to be. So material wealth is not always indicative of God's blessing. The lesson behind point number one is this. When we are persecuted for doing right, don't be shocked. Because sometimes what happens is when we're persecuted, we think we must be doing something wrong. Therefore, we have to change our message. We have to change the way we do things. Jesus is saying, if I told it to you and you do it and they still try to persecute you, then just keep doing it. Keep loving on them. Keep telling the truth. Do you know why? Because Jesus says, I see everything. He says, I see it. That is why. Don't lose hope. Continue on. In fact, Jesus is going to tell them this command to continue in the second view that he gives, which is actually his last view. Jesus expresses his point number two, command to the church. So he's going to give a final command to this church, which we see in verses 10 to 11. So in verse 10, Jesus says, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Yes, it's the devil who moves in unbelievers so that they hate Christians and moves within them to attack Christians, even though they can't necessarily kill them all the time. But the devil will move within them to make the life of Christians very hard. And we see that, of course, even here in the United States. Now, I want to get something clear. When God says he's testing the church, it's not the same as saying he's tempting the church. I want you to know the difference because Satan tempts, but God tests. And sometimes God uses Satan's temptation to test 
the church. Satan tempts in order to get us to do bad, but God tests in order to bring out the character within us, to persevere. Oh yeah, we see that in James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Remember this? James says, Consider all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Yeah, so this pretty much shows that if you have true faith, no matter what comes at you from the outside, your faith will never break. And this is what we see in the Old Testament with Job, right? And this is what we're seeing with the Christians here as well. God is going to preserve them until the day they are glorified and go to be with God. So that is why we need to hang in there. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Polycarp. He was one of the most notable church figures in history. He was born in the year 69 and was even a disciple of the Apostle John. Yes, this is in history. Interestingly, he went on to become the pastor of the church in Smyrna. Mm -hmm. But like many other Christians, Polycarp got into trouble with the government and with society for his stance on the gospel, and he was condemned to death by burning. He became one of the most inspirational martyrs in church history. When he was announced, or when he was commanded to renounce his faith, this is what Polycarp said. He said, 80 and six years I served Jesus, and he never did me any injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? Wow. Wow. That is faith right there. But the question is, is that the faith that all of us have? Because, you know, sometimes God will move within the churches to bring persecution in order to sift the church to see who has true faith and who has no faith at all. But here we see a man who truly does have faith. Now, let me tell you this as well. Just because you're in Jesus doesn't necessarily mean that God will always rescue you from death. There have been many times in which people have died. They were burned at the stake, but it doesn't mean God doesn't care for them. It just means he has a different purpose for them. But to some people, God will rescue. You see, in this situation, he told the church that they were going to be in jail for about 10 days. They're going to be tortured there. They're going to be pretty much pressure to renounce their faith, but they are going to come out of it victorious and God is in control. Once again, just like I said earlier, the Smyrna church, Jesus has nothing bad to say about them. Wow, so that means this church was probably doing a lot of things right. They were holding on to the gospel. They were doing discipleship. They were probably doing evangelism. Um, they had love in the church. They were not compromising with heresy and unrepentant sin. And for that, Jesus is about to reward. Praise the Lord. Let's see that in the last verse. Or rather, let's see that in the last half of verse 10. See here, he says, Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. So he tells them, even though you've come this far, don't give up yet because there's still a little bit more distance to get to the finish line. I'm commanding you, you still have to go. Remember, we're all human, so we can pretty much stumble at any time, which is why Jesus tells them, gives them that exhortation to continue running. And you know what he's going to do? He says, I'm going to give you the crown. You know what crowns are? They were pretty much these wreaths that were given to winners of athletic competitions back then in Roman Empire. So basically, God says that I am going to give you the prize of eternal life, as well as everything that you've done for me or your faithfulness. See, that's why James, in chapter 1, verse 12, he says this, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So that's why he tells us in verse 11, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. So how do you overcome? 
you overcome simply by being a Christian. When you place your faith, your trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior, God forgives you of your sin. He gives you his righteousness. And that's the reason why you can overcome death. Yes. So once we are filled with the Holy Spirit, not only are we saved, but God transforms us so that we can do all these deeds for God. We can love God. We can persevere. So we become an overcomer in every single way. And he says that if you are in this category, do you know what will happen to you? You are going to escape the second death. You're probably asking, what is that? Well, I'll make it pretty simple. What's the first death? In this life, we die physically, right? But then the second death, he's going to elaborate in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15, which is the lake of fire. Very tragic and very scary. He says that that's pretty much where all unbelievers are going to end up in, the eternal death process right there. And he says, when you place your faith in Jesus, that one of the greatest benefits that happens is that you escape eternity in hell. And, you know, really, when I do evangelism, that's one of the things I really try to hit home. I mean, I love the fact that they're going to enjoy this fellowship with God forever, but I, I have to tell them that there is a hell coming. And, you, you know, just so that they can awaken to see how serious their, their sins are. And nobody wants to go to hell, right? We all want to be saved and go to heaven. And that's why he's telling them this, that this is really one of the greatest advantages of believing in Jesus for salvation. So the lesson behind point number two is this. When suffering happens, God will not always take it away in every single situation. If the Lord decides to allow the suffering to continue, even for a certain time, are you going to be faithful still? Or are you going to raise up your fist and, at God and get angry at him? Because if the church back then could do it, we can do it as well. We can persevere in the faith. So in conclusion, once again, Jesus gives his analysis, his command to the Smyrna church in order to show us what a faithful church looks like and why we need to be one as well. So I want to encourage you with this. And this is a very serious question because this is something that happens in churches around the world. If an enemy comes into the church, whether they be a communist, whether they be somebody from another religion, if they were to point a gun at your head and ask you to renounce Jesus, would you say yes or would you say no? Because I'm telling you, I know that there's probably a lot of people here in the United States. If you were to go into a lot of these lukewarm apostate churches, a lot of them would pretty much deny Jesus. And sometimes God does that in order to see who has real faith. Maybe today you're listening and you're saying, ah, Pastor Steve, I don't know if my faith is real. I don't know if I've committed to Jesus like this. This sounds so scary. I mean, this could possibly happen to me? And the answer is yes, it could possibly happen to you. But remember, Jesus said it's not going to be an easy life. Faith is denying yourself, taking up your cross and following Jesus. He's been telling you that since the very beginning in the Gospels. So that's why we shouldn't be shocked when persecution comes. So today, if you still have not believed in Jesus as Lord and Savior, do so. Say, Lord, I confess my sin to you and I want to turn away from that and I want to believe in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And do you know what God is going to do? He's not just going to forgive you of your sins. He's going to give you the strength. He's going to give you the love of God so that you can pretty much persevere in your faith, even in difficult situations. It will be so miraculous that you don't even know how to explain it. But that's really one of the hopes of the gospel. So I want to encourage you with this. I know none of you guys are probably suffering persecution right now. But if it does ever happen, just try to remember passages like these so that you don't freak out when those things happen. But just remember, God is still in control. And your perseverance, God sees it. 
and he is very glad with it, and he is ready to reward. Remember, God says there is a day of judgment coming for the enemies, but if you are on the right side, stay on the right side, and God will reward you in due time. Father, we pray to thank you for this really important reminder of why we need to persevere in the faith. You tell us not to be shocked when persecution comes to us because it came to the church back then and it comes to many churches today. Lord, if there have been times in which we have been cowards and we have not expressed our faith when we should have, we ask for your forgiveness because there are times in which we can be like the Apostle Peter, that we deny you a few times, but if you can forgive us, we pray, Lord, that you will forgive us of our sins and to give us the strength so that we can run this race and persevere so that you can say, well done, my good and faithful slave. We continue in this life and we don't know what is ahead, but whatever it is, Lord, Give us strength, whether it's in rain or sunshine, to endure it all, to keep working for the kingdom, to bring others to faith, all to the glory of Jesus. We pray all this in his name. Amen.